Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to this webinar uh, with uh, Richa from uh, BRCGS. Uh, we're going to be talking today about the initiation of uh, the new BRCGS Food Standard Number 9. Wow, number nine already. Uh, and with our friend Richa, uh, how, how, Richa, sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, Richa, how are you doing? Yes, I'm very well, thank you, Simon. Uh, yeah, nine's just come about, even while I think everybody's just getting used to it. So yeah. Good luck to us and everyone. A lot of work to come, but you're going to be yeah. talking about that. So just tell the audience where you're joining from today, Richard. Yeah, so uh, I'm based in Reading in England. Uh, so that's pretty much like 45 minutes away from Heathrow, just to give some perspective to the audience if they're not familiar with the Reading area. Yeah, and what's the uh, the weather? Have you got any sun today? Oh, I wish, I wish. It's just been quite miserable the last few days, I would say. Today is mm. quite windy and there was some weather warning, so not, yeah. not quite pleasant as such. Well, I'm, I'm in uh, Lancashire, um, near Manchester, and uh, it's just stopped raining, actually, and a bit of, bit of sun. So, oh, lucky nice. you, lucky no. you. So everybody type in, tell us where you're joining us from today. And uh, it's always nice to see, can you uh, can see that? Um, Arizona, Boston, Toronto, India, yeah, just about everywhere in the world. Anyway, you're all welcome. I'm going to play the sponsor uh, ads now. We're back in a couple of minutes for the presentation with Richard. A lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward.
Thanks to the sponsors. Uh, presentation's ready. I'll be back for the Q&A after the presentation, but for now, I'll hand you over to Richard. Thanks, Simon. And uh, welcome again, everyone, uh, to the session on initiation of the Global Standard for Food Safety, Issue 9, and the upcoming development to work. So the agenda for today, we'll uh, quickly look at our history, BRCGS as an organization, then objectives of the review, why actually do we go about reviewing our standard, looking at the management process, of it's not just uh, as it might be seen as a few select individuals sat in a room and deciding how the standard's written, but there is a full governance process behind it. So I'll be taking you through that. Uh, then we look at the status review, and that is around food issue eight, how the standard's doing, and uh, just a brief picture of where issue eight starts, followed by look at the key influences of what has actually brought about the change or the next version of the standard. Then we look at the most common non-conformities that were raised with issue eight or that we are still seeing with issue eight. And we'll talk a little bit about them. Then uh, moving on to the consultation comments. So this is just a very quick sneak peek into what the comments have been until now. So for those of you who are aware, we have the process of uh, public consultation open on issue eight at the moment. Uh, moving on to issue nine timelines. So I'll give you a very quick brief into what the timelines for issue nine look like. And uh, finally, looking at how can you get involved and influence the standard and that is the next upcoming version. So uh, kicking off with our history, as most of you would have known us, we were BRC when we were first set up in, 90, in the year 1996 and uh, known as BRC Global Standards, which was set up by a number of UK retailers. Everything came about just to reduce the uh, audit fatigue essentially. So duplication of audits was the main key concern and added that added value that one audit actually can give to the consumer as well as the retailers essentially. So that was the basic premise around where BRC came from. The food standard, as we know, was first published in the year 1998. Now, since in the year 2000, we underwent our uh, GFSI recognition and uh, from there on a number of other standards have been published so we have a plethora of standards packaging consumer products followed by storage and distribution agents and brokers and uh, then in the near in the year 2016 we were acquired by the LGC group now this is where the BRC uh, trade association which we were a part of we split from them and the standards division, it moved on over into the LGC group. Following that, we underwent a launch, a relaunch essentially, the branding was changed and uh, we are since called BRCGS. So we are not BRC, but brand reputation through compliance global standards is what we know. Uh, 20, 18, we acquired another group in the North American region called the Allergen Control Group. They are the ones that specialize in free from standards. And uh, since then, we have published the plant-based and the gluten-free standard as well. And uh, the newest addition to the family is the ethical trade and responsible sourcing. Uh, food, as we know, currently stands on version 8. And the reason we are here today is to look at going into the next version, that is version 9. So let's think, look at the objectives of why do we actually rewrite the standard? What is the need to move on from issue 8 to issue 9? So first and foremost, it is to just make sure 
that the standard is always kept relevant. It is relevant to the industry need, meets the requirements, uh, the food safety, quality, integrity practices that the customer requires, as well as safeguards the due diligence of the organizations that use our standard. Uh, if you say that uh, since its publication in 1998, if we were still sat on issue one, you know, essentially that would have not really added value to the industry, to the organization, and would have been quite redundant. So we always look at making sure the standards kept relevant and up to date. Now, as is the case with most of our standards, there's always the consultation and review of any emerging new concerns and uh, opportunities that are identified. Now, whether these are through discussions that we have with the retailers, or whether it's through discussions that we might have with individuals like yourselves, webinars, presentations, conferences that we attend. Additionally, we uh, the various sort of groups that we represent into, there's always discussions, feedback, and comments that come about. So as soon as a standard's published, for example, as soon as issue eight was published, there's always been comments around how can we improve? What can we improve? And uh, those areas are captured by the global standards managers, essentially, like myself. So I lead, I will be leading the Food 9 development work. So all those comments, they're captured by us and we take it back to the working group. We'll look at how the working groups work in a minute and uh, explain what that process looks like. So all of this review of concerns, uh, issues, they all collated, put together and taken back. And uh, that's how the standard is actually influenced. Uh, I've touched upon this quite briefly. Focus on improving food safety, integrity, and quality for consumers. So it's uh, areas that, as you must have seen with issue eight, there came the introduction of food safety culture. Food safety culture at that point, we were the very first standard to have introduced that. Uh, since then, the other GFSI benchmark standards have gone about with the food safety culture introduction, as well as GFSI benchmark itself introduced that. And uh, now going into it, if you look at the legislations in various countries, so as you must, or you may know that within the European Union itself, there's a new legislation that will be requesting or requiring product safety culture to be a part. And uh, that that's sort of like coming about. So uh, we just focus on improving the elements and uh, making sure that the standard always keeps relevant and adds value to the organization just to avoid that duplication and then making sure that the standard's still relevant in life. Uh, additionally, we look at uh, removing, adding, simplifying, or modernizing the standard. What this means is certain clauses, the way the wording is, we do generally get feedback around uh, the, the use of terminology or the verbiage is not really it does not resonate with the either the industry or with certain organizations it's not really quite well understood and the use of certain words is not understood globally so we we could look at changing that or the way the clause is worded it sort of means one way to one organization and other way to another organization or there's a word usage that could be seen as a little bit more complex so what we tend to do is just make sure all of that again is captured and is influenced in the next iteration. Uh, and finally, as is the case, we do try to make sure that we maintain our focus on operation rather than just being seen as a standard that's fairly prescriptive and hence a lot more requirement for documentation. As you would have seen, the way the audits are conducted, our audit duration calculators always stress upon the fact that uh, the audit has to be sort of a 50-50 split at a minimum, 50% uh, of the time that the auditor spends should be on the factory floor or the site uh, walkarounds instead of just being captured in the office and going through that documentation review process. So what we tend to do is the way the standards are written, the clauses that they are reviewed, wherever we can, we try to just go and re trig our focus on making sure that uh, documentation, don't get me wrong, very important from a due diligence point of view, 
that is your control measure in case anything, God forbid, anything goes wrong. This is what you'll be presenting to the, uh, if you end up in court, that, that, that is exactly what's needed. But from an operational point of view, it just gives you that added value of the audit, where the auditor as an unbiased entity goes in and can add that value to your organization. So these are some of the key objectives of why we would look at reviewing a standard. So moving on to, as I said, uh, just explaining fairly briefly the review process of how do we manage the rewrite. So essentially, at the core sits the BRCGS Global Standards Team, and uh, that's the self-included with a few other technical managers, very small team, and uh, we are sort of like the technical experts within the field or the standard that we operate in. We uh, work on various sort of, uh, as I said, uh, pieces of review, feedback, consultation, anything, any feedback that comes in related to a certain standard goes to one specific member of the team. And we collate that throughout the year of the, or the life of the standard. So essentially, uh, we look at reviewing our standards somewhere between sort of like after three years, essentially. So in within the three years life, we will be receiving feedback from various sources as touched up upon before, or we might have done some pilot audits or there's some sort of roadshows, conferences that we attended or webinars that we're attending. So essentially, uh, we'll collate all that feedback that sits with the team and uh, we'll take it back to the working group. Above us sits our international advisory board. So that is the, that uh, again, members from various organizations so these are retailers they are brand owners so quite big organizations so we have members on our international advisory board globally who provide that direction and oversee the progress any direction related to what are the new sort of like upcoming themes any challenges the industry is facing so we really rely heavily on the industry in the international advisory board to provide that direction and oversee what goes into the standards is pretty much relevant as well. So they are our bouncing board as well as a platform that sense checks the work that we conduct. And uh, uh, finally, once we get into writing the actual standard, what we do is we pull together a working group. So the working group uh, usually is made up of food industry. Then there's a uh, member that there's sort of uh, a very even membership, essentially. What we do is we sent out a call for interest, which was sent out somewhere in April, and that was open to everyone to, part to participate in. So people could submit their names and uh, just express their interest to be on the working group when the rewrite process initiates, and that's the case with all the standards. Um, this process is managed in Europe, so you would see the working group is sort of like managed from Europe, but it's a global working group. So we have representation across the globe. We uh, try and get representation, as I said, from the food industry, retailers. We have members from the certification bodies as well on the working group. Additionally, we have uh, members from the trade associations who can actually explain and uh, sense check again the applicability of certain clauses, the relevance of the standard to the sector of the industry that they represent from. So, uh, and there could be other bodies as well, uh, some sort of legal bodies that are quite well known within the food industry. So we'll have representation from that. And what they do is they help us review and develop the standard, the protocol. And uh, what we do is we have physical working groups, but considering the situation that we are in, currently so most of our working groups have been uh, virtual and then possibly we do have subgroups so where we might need a certain region globally to focus on a certain sector or that's what they specialize in we might run separate subgroups where they can provide their input and uh, their sort of comments are taken into consideration additionally we can even run some conference calls but this is all sort of like uh, quite restricted and limited to a working group so representation as i said applications come in we review the application based on experience based on sort of the industry sectors as well as sort of uh, that there's uh, quite a comprehensive process behind it so applications reviewed and then uh, the team 
essentially signs off the representation and that's when the working group is finalized. So uh, the situation that we are in currently, the working group has been finalized and we will be starting the rewrite process uh, next month. I will look at the timeline slide in a minute. So moving on, uh, looking at the current status of where food aid is, we, as you know, the, the food standard is the biggest of the BRCGS standards. What we have is roughly 21, K plus certificated sites within the scheme. Uh, the standard has a strong growth rate, essentially of 2.9%, not the highest. We do have some really quickly rising standards as well. Uh, for example, uh, storage and distribution. So that is one of uh, quickly, a very sort of like fast growing standard. Similarly, looking at the new ones, the gluten-free, the plant-based. So these standards are picking up pace quite quickly. We have presence in 118 countries. And uh, if you look at the top three countries, so the largest being UK, so followed by China and uh, Italy. Uh, then if we start looking at the other trends, so we have quite good presence within, uh, uh, as I said, 118 nations. And uh, Netherlands, again, is one of the fastest growing region for us. Uh, currently, we have 67 approved certification bodies that are, uh, approved to undertake the food audits and uh, the list of all the certification bodies along with the star rating is all published on our website and BRCGS directory publicly available for anyone planning to undertake a BRCGS audit they can go in choose the certification body of their liking and go ahead with the audit itself and this is all sort of uh, broken down the uh, as I said the star rating comes from a KPI process a compliance process that we have where we govern the work that the certification bodies are doing and how well they are operating so that five star rating again would help sites to make that decision for themselves okay so now uh, moving on on to looking at the key influences of what has actually brought about food nine so where we've looked at the generic objectives these are the key influences that we have noticed or so based on the feedback that we've seen and uh, how the food line sort of would look at evolving. So first of all, changes in global food safety legislation as indicated already. We do keep an eye on the changes globally. We do have, uh, we, we, we have sort of, uh, we are parts or members of certain organizations. And uh, again, we keep ourselves up to date with what's going on around the different region different sectors one example as stated already is around the food safety culture legislation that's coming about so it, it's just making sure that once we are going into rewriting a standard it's uh, just ensuring that uh, the legislations are taken into consideration any new emerging risks that might be coming up so where we have seen that there's uh, issues going about with coated chicken products and uh, around cooking and how the consumers kept up to date. There's other issues around uh, uh, your vacuum pack products. So we'll keep an eye on that and then make sure those, those are influenced within the standard. Other areas to look at is the ice cream plants. So as you might know, within our standards, we have high risk, high care and ambient high care as sections, separate sections. So we will look at uh, the ice cream plants uh, have been quite an interesting discussion. So I don't want to take up much time because again, as you might know, we are quite passionate about certain topics. And <laughs> if you go into the detail, it's just like uh, you deviate from the main point. But yeah, ice cream have been a good discussion. There's other areas like cook crustaceans. So where do they fit in, in within the entire high-risk, high-care uh, arena uh, are the things that we will be discussing with the working group. Uh, moving on, on to GFSI benchmark requirements. Those of you who are certificated to the BRCGS standard would know that uh, whenever the benchmark comes out, we, are, we always uh, take pride in getting the GFSI benchmark requirements uh, compliant to our standards fairly quickly so we can proceed with the benchmark um all our standards all would, would be sort of like one of the first ones to go in and get the compliance done so any requirements that have come about so namely uh, the industry already has noticed that there's the introduction of one in three unannounced audits so those requirements there are position statements 
that have been set out uh, on our website. So uh, those requirements, while they are set outside the standard at the moment, they will be incorporated within the standard when we go into rewriting. Uh, continuous improvement, as is always the case. So we take learnings from, we get data on the product recalls from sites. So that is fed through the certification bodies on through to us. We will review that data and make sure that any areas, any uh, any any sort of product types, any root causes that are actually influencing and making that uh, product sort of uh, unsafe or any trends that are coming out, so they all incorporated within our uh, standard. Similarly, with the non-conformity data, so all the non-conformances on a global scale, any audit that's done is captured and uh, is available for us to trend. So we will be looking at those trends as well while we're reviewing the standard. Now, technological developments, I guess with the situation that we are in, so we've all had to learn fairly quickly, adjust to the pandemic, and uh, that's changed the way of working quite dramatically. Everyone had to learn fairly quickly. So what are the learnings that we can take from uh, that quick adaptation? What could be taken forward into the standard? Could uh, remote audits or elements of remote audits be added into the standard? What do we keep? What do we uh, not? What are those areas that the standard can actually learn or benefit from would be another consideration for, uh, for us when we go into the rewrite process. And finally, continued feedback on food aid, uh, food standard issue aid. So this is just the anything and everything that everyone's feeding on. And we will have a look at some of the comments that have already come in until now uh, on food aid. So we'll just give you a flavor of what sort of feedback we receive. And uh, again, there's no guarantee that all of that feedback would be incorporated within the standard, but definitely something that we look at and is considered as a part of the uh, working groups. So moving on and looking at some of the most common non-conformances. So these are the top six non-conformances that we have seen with issue eight. With issue eight, as you know, it was first published in 2018. Then 2019, we were supposed to have the first audit so standard published in august audits in february 19. so the first audit against uh issue eight would have been from feb 2019 onwards and uh, then hit the pandemic so essentially where was normal audits then it's gone into the COVID era so what this is is we are cognizant of the fact that some of the number some of the non-conformances might have changed or shift, shifted in terms of patterns. However, this is what the current picture is. This is taking into consideration overall, both pandemic and non-pandemic. So we have not really split up the influences, but uh, all I can say is that uh, COVID against non-COVID, the trends were very similar, similar non-conformances. So nothing has dramatically changed. It's just where it's number one pre-COVID, it could be number three post-COVID sort of essentially or pre or vice versa. So uh, this sort of like pastel paints quite a good picture. So if you look at the top global non-conformance, this is around premise and equipment hygiene. So what this is, is essentially, it could be any issues around cleanliness, so where sites might have uh, that they've not really cleaned one area. It could be your redundant equipments, or it could be equipments that sort of like are used and they've not really been uh, kept up to sort of uh, the mark. So essentially, that's that's sort of like the the type of non-conformances that get raised around 4.9.1. Now the next one is equipment construction and maintenance. Now this could be laps in your uh, and your your plant preventative maintenance plans, or it could be around the information that's missing when an equipment's been commissioned. So it's, it's sort of a, that, that's where the non conformances range and vary. Now, food safety culture plan, uh, this is an interesting one. As I mentioned, like pre COVID, this was primarily one of the top non conformances. 
that came about because it was a new clause, a new addition to the standard. So the industry, as you would expect, they were taking the time to get used to it. And since then, it's moved numbering and now it's the top third from the top first. 2.7.1, hazard identification. This again was uh, because this, there was a change in the clause and uh, there was the, with the addition of radiological that sort of threw the industry off a little bit and that's where 2.7.1 came about. Um, now doors is something which uh, is, has been in within the top 10 non-conformances for, for a couple of iterations of the standard. It is quite frustrating because uh, as you can imagine from a standard point of view, doors is something that the sites can actually very easily and quickly take care of. These are both internal and external where there's gaps under the doors, it could be damage to the door. Now, if you look at it fundamentally, the doors could be picked up within your internal audit plans or just basic awareness. And uh, that's where we find this non-conformance quite frustrating, but uh, we will be looking at ways, how can we improve or strengthen or give the industry some tools where some of these sort of frustrating non-conformances can actually be alleviated. Um, and then uh, the sixth is around chemical control. So this perhaps is sort of like just around how you manage chemicals on your site, keep them sort of away, logged and uh, different. So these are, as you can see, the top trends around the non-conformities globally that we've seen with issue eight. And those will be taken into consideration and will be presented to the working group. And we will try to find a way around how can we improve some of these elements. So uh, as I was saying, around consultation comments, just to give you a very quick sneak peek into what sort of comments have come about to date. Uh, for food safety culture requirements. So the uh, users are actually asking for further clarification around food safety culture requirements. They're asking about strengthening. They're asking about just adding further clarity into it. So that's what they, they're looking at for uh, support with the food safety culture requirement clauses. Supplier approval clause implementation. Supplier approval has been a little bit frustrating for the industry considering the range of suppliers that an organization might have from very small suppliers to your customer specified suppliers to some really big brands where supplier approvals not really been possible so how do you go about implementation so there's clarity requested around the implementation of 3.5.1.2 uh, additionally sort of like which might even link into the exceptional supplier approval procedure so that, that those are sort of the things that we're seeing within the consultation. Um, environmental monitoring, clause applicability. So what they are, there are certain product types where uh, one might just argue that yes, environmental monitoring plans not really required. And uh, what happens then because there is justification behind not having, or maybe that environmental monitoring is not really gonna add value to the industry. So there's clarification requested on environmental monitoring. Um, then business continuity plans post pandemic, what they are requesting or asking for is what, again, uh, elements like uh, remote auditing, technology, cybersecurity, what will we take forward? So this is sort of a question that has been posed. Um, food authenticity section. So this, this always sort of seems to be one of the favorites and uh, one of the ones where there seems still seems to be a lot of confusion around. So that's your vulnerability assessment plans. Um, discussions we have is around uh, the difference between where the product is actually the site site owned, high value against a customer specified product where the site does not have much control over it. So how would you distinguish what controls can be put in? So there, that sort of like elements and clarity is what they're requesting there. Our environmental monitoring applicability within high risk and high care. Again, as you can imagine, one of those sections where uh, people uh, are requiring sort of, uh, again, based on product type, what is acceptable, what's not acceptable. So that sort of guidance. Uh, site security, food defense, 
again one of the loved sections we would say and uh, this is just the uh, in regards to uh, how to go about certain implementation uh, around the clauses is what they are requesting address audit fatigue uh, again sort of something that uh, we aim for we constantly have discussions with the retailers specifiers brand owners how can we influence and reduce the number of audits that a site is undertaking and uh, help with that so those discussions have always been ongoing sometimes successful sometimes not but definitely again will be something we'll be taking back to the working group and finally reintroduction of the two-part audit so for those of you who are not aware we did have within version 7 a part announced part and announced audit uh, which was uh, just to support sites with the unannounced audit and with the reintroduction of one and three unannounced uh, requests have come in if we could reintroduce this for smaller sites so this is again a proposal that we'll take back to the working group and see uh, whether there is seen any better there is any benefit or will there be any benefit in reintroducing this option um as promised uh, before sort of uh, wrapping up just wanted to give you an overview of where we are and what the timelines for the food standard looks like so currently the consultation on issue eight is open so i'll uh, the last slide i'll show you how can you go about and have your input into it so this will be open for another 10 days please feel free to go in and uh, give us all the uh, frustrations goods bads whatever you might have with the standard and let us know so we can take that into consideration the working group meetings will run from june to december there will be public consultation on uh, issue nine and that will run from somewhere around mid-december to mid-jan Following that, from Feb onwards, we'll be developing the training courses and uh, all the other various publications. Then the standard will be published 1st August 2022, is roughly the timeline that we're looking at. And first audits again, issue nine. As you know, we always give the industry an opportunity to familiarize themselves with the standards. So, first audits would be six months later, so likely from 1st Feb. 2023. So how do you get involved? As I said, uh, there's the public consultations open. You can find links to comment on the RCGS website, or you can visit the LinkedIn or the Facebook pages, provide your feedback through a jot form, or you can download the form. That's a doc form. So where people find it easy to just uh, type the comments in while they're working through. Uh, so it's a word document. Just uh, type your feedback and then you can email your comments to inquiries at brcgs.com. And the closing date for submissions on this feedback is the 31st of May 2021. So any anything, anyhow, and the, I, we would really request you to get involved and let us know your thoughts on the current version, anything you would like to influence. So now is the opportunity for sort of the, we seal the deal essentially. <laughs> And uh, that, that's pretty much it from me for today. Okay, thanks very much, Richard. Um, let's take the slides down. Yeah, so you welcome feedback and uh, input to improve the that shape the standard. So everybody is your first opportunity. <laughs> to, so, um, Maggie, for, firstly, um, I mean, this does come up a lot. Um, uh, sorry, no, it wasn't Maggie. It scrolled too quickly. Um, there was a question. I can't see who, who it was from, but are there any plans to um, amalgamate all standards and have one standard? <laughs> I know the answer, but go on. Okay. Um, never say never, but not not in the foreseeable future is all i can say because that'll become quite burdensome for the industry as well and then uh, where we are known for being prescriptive and explaining exactly what the requirements are we might muddy a lot of waters but um a thought we can take back to the organization and then they can decide <laughs> which way they would like to yeah i mean yeah. gfsi um benchmark was a step to harmonize um 
<clears throat> but obviously there's still people who have multiple audits and different customer requirements or supplying into different markets etc um okay um maggie this is from maggie um opinion gfsi and approved schemes need to focus on food safety legality and quality many elements are straying from these oh so maggie thinks we're losing sight of the main um uh goal which is food safety legality and quality do you do you agree with that or um uh if if, if maddie can elaborate a little bit then perhaps <laughs> i can provide my opinion but in regards to various uh gfsi benchmark standards i guess with certain certification program owners there's different ways of working it there's likes there's dislikes there's a ways that a certain uh, CPO would go about interpreting the requirements and then you have the baseline that's your food safety, quality, legality, and then you can build on top of it based on how you see yourself. And we take pride in being one of the stringent standards, essentially, because that's what our customers require of us. Now, whether we are straying away from the elements of food safety, quality, legality, I think I would disagree because I think what we are doing is actually adding further value that GFSI is setting the baseline and we are going one step above. And all that does is just adds to that due diligence piece that we all strive to essentially. That is the end goal. That is your customer safety. Okay. Uh, BG Ravikumar, can BRC food category numbering be revised in line with GFSI numbering like A, B, C, D, et cetera? Um, it, it would be a little bit difficult because the GFSI numbering A, B, C, D is more fee farm gate and then it goes into your pet food and so on and so forth. The way our requirements are structured, uh, we do try and put most of them together. So essentially what Ravi is asking for is to split the standard into various sections which could turn out to be a little bit tricky however what we can do is look at in case the way our categories are structured that's the 18 food categories in case we can provide some clarity around which GFSI category it might sit in so okay. we can always look at that yeah great Francis uh, the sincerest form of flattery is the forging of certificates what more is being done to prevent fraud Ooh, okay, that's a really good question. So um, within BRCGS, what we take pride in, and uh, you might have seen with our symbol, so it's B, R, and then there's a big C, and there's a small G, and then S. So what that's big C is the compliance. So for us, we take pride in our compliance program. So what that compliance program is, we in addition, so your the way are the organization structured, we write the standards, then come the certification bodies that go in and do the audits. Then we have auditors who do the audits, but certification bodies and auditors are separate to us. We do not have an influence in them. However, we have the governance program that controls and goes out and checks how these audits are conducted. So we have a pool of compliance auditors. They will go in and assess the site. So these are unannounced audits and uh, the compliance auditors will be witnessing the auditors at the same time to just sense check, assess how the audits are done. And uh, so that would be one form to control the fraud element. The second thing is uh, where we have the requirements of whistle blowing within our standards. We operate to a similar whistle blowing program. So it's called Tell Us. What that is, is uh, you can confidentially come in and report any fraud certificates. It will all be kept anonymous unless somebody wants to just state that who they are. But uh, otherwise, anonymity is a big part of it. You come in report and the, and the independent unbiased compliance member would go in and uh, look at and investigate and provide you with the feedback on that as well. So the compliance audits, uh, they are done globally. It's not limited to a region. Compliance auditors are based and they are located out of almost sort of like every region you can say, not potentially every region, but they are quite nicely scattered. But yeah, there's quite a few steps with compliance. Yes, an independent entity within BRCGS who looks after these elements. Okay, thanks for clearing that up. Uh, Gabriella, can you confirm the first issue date in 2023? 
um, if they mean the first audit, so the audits, if um, at the moment, the timeline that I displayed is a tentative timeline. This is what we are working to uh, as soon as the standards published and we are aiming for the 1st August publication date. If it gets published on 1st of August, then it'll be the 1st of February 2023 when the first audit against issue nine happens. And that's usually a very hard cutoff. So what that means, if your audit starts on in January 31st Jan, then it'll be issue eight audit. But if it starts on 1st of Feb, then it'll be issue nine audit. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> from Mario, um, BRC Global Standards start uh, in version one. Will will that be updated? Uh, any uh, it will be. It will be. Uh, we we are aiming for as soon as the food standards done. So we will be looking at revising the start standard as well. We do not have fixed timelines yet, but considering start standard is spin off from the food standard. So essentially, the organization believes that it would be added value in uh, getting the food standard done, and then we look at the start standard because it's, uh, yeah, they, they sink a little bit. Yeah. Um, I don't know, BJ Ravi Kumar, can you elaborate on high care, high risk, and ambient care requirements? It, uh, <laughs> any, it, I mean, it's a bit it's a bit detailed, that really, is it? Anything? Uh, all I would say is please go check the standards. So towards the back of the standard, there is an appendix with quite a lot of detailed information on high risk, high care, and ambient high care requirements. Additionally, there is an understanding guideline that we have on our website. So if you are signed up to BRCGS, then on participate, you have free access to these guideline documents. But I think if you start talking about these requirements now, we would be here forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Clement, uh, how compatible is the new standard with ISO 22000 2018? I doubt it is at all, is it? Um, all I can say is we do look at various standards. ISO 22000 we would look at, but it's, it's not sort of something that we work off. We would work off GFSI benchmark as the base consideration. Yeah. Okay. And Syed, uh, food safety culture is still a subject. Um, is there any plan to issue some parameters that can be used to measure food safety culture? Um, all I can say is food safety culture definitely is something that the industry is looking for further clarification, feedback, and elaborating the requirements on. What they might, what that might look like, not really sure. All I would say is if parameters or having sort of a measure on food safety culture, something that Syed you're interested in, then please uh, go and feed that back onto the consultation comments. So it's captured and we'll take it back to the working group and then try and look at what can be done. Um, yeah. Uh, Maggie's just saying food safety, uh, this is from earlier, so she's, so she's expanding. Sure, food safety culture is an effect, not a cause. This is straying from and weakening the core of GFSI audits. So Maggie's quite strongly believes that food safety culture is straying from, um, you know, food safety, legality, equality, etc. But that's an opinion. Um, I would definitely say it's it's uh, Maggie's opinion, and uh, there would be people that say for and against. Uh, I think if the comment goes back to GFSI, there might be a similar <laughs> sort of uh, split around the organization of whether it is or not. Um, my personal comments, I would rather keep them away. Uh, but uh, for, for, for as an organization, all I can say is we definitely believe that food safety culture, although it is a gray area, it's something that really strengthens and adds value to the organization and uh, if you look at the way the food safety culture assessments are done organizations have definitely seen a lot of value from uh, how they've gone about not knowing to slowly recognizing how can they strengthen certain areas and at least be aware of what's causing certain issues and uh, if organizations are providing that positive feedback and they are the ones that are actually using and making the most of it, then who are we to disagree? But uh, 
absolutely maggie we value your opinion your feedback and gfsi wise if the, this is what you believe in uh, they do open up uh, consultations from time to time on various subjects so please do feedback to gfsi and i'm sure comments would be taken into consideration and looked at okay uh vibav uh can you please add food products and label legality in more it, so does uh, does Viba mean add into version nine he wants to see more on food products and label legality um again all i would say is around la legality and labeling legality we do have some quite strong sections and the feedback currently is that definitely it, it does uh, do what's intended however if ever you have any recommendations then please do let us know how would you like to add more or what would you like to see more of yeah. and uh, yeah please do feed that back through the consultation process and uh, we'll take it back to the working group sure yeah Alison where can we go to find information on what the changes will be for BRC 9 standard once they're implemented so where where will we see that information so uh, as I said, currently we are just talking about starting the revision process, which will take roughly five, six months. By end of December, we should be in a very comfortable position to issue the draft standard. So the draft is usually made publicly available to everyone to comment on. It will be out on our website. If you are a BRCGS certified site, we do even send notes out in our uh various sort of like comments so there'll be linkedin posts there'll be facebook posts there'll be emails that come through as well as there'll be sort of bulletins that are sent to the site so there'll be a lot of information we just make sure we we, we do really appreciate that people look at it and the sense check it for their organizations and their value that sort of feedback is really valuable as well so we'll make a lot of noise about it just watch out but it would be somewhere around december jan okay. that's all i can say for now very good and Shrida. Uh, what about animal food and animal feed? Um, um, okay, uh, something we will consider is where I would like to leave up because uh, the requirements around animal food, animal feed are fairly, uh, they are similar but a little bit different and there are some additional considerations that we might need to build into the standard. It is not a decision that I can make or one person can make. It will be a decision that the organization will have to make as a whole, whether we go ahead with it or not. There are requirements within the standard, but it's not explicit. We just focus on pet food for now. So okay. uh, just watch out. And again, Shridant, if, if, if you would like to please feed that back through consultation process, and uh, at least it's all in one place and we'll take that into consideration. Okay, Jeanette, is it possible that a food defence qualified individual will be required in BRC? <laughs> um, in, in what sense? Is, is, uh, it, is it a question on uh, uh, having an individual who just does food defence? If you could just clarify. Yeah. That would be appreciated. So uh, obviously we're in the very very early stages of gathering uh, import, but uh, eventually there will, will there be a draft that uh, for comment? And oh, where will, And where will that normally be? It will be on the website. It will be there'll be posts on. So everything sort of like published on the website. Keep an eye out for it. But as I said, it will be towards the end of the year, and not anytime soon. Okay. So in the meantime, just uh, watch the space is all I can say. Yeah. Uh, Ruth, will there be a current issue of this after nine? Uh, preventive controls for human food rule comparison issue first April 2016. I'm not sure I understand that, do you? Uh, unless, Ruth, this is about uh, guidelines, we might, guideline we might have published. Now, uh, we do publish various guideline documents from time to time. But that is in line with the sort of current requirement of the industry or whether it's relevant to the standard. So if this document is still relevant, please, again, drop us a note. You can drop it through cons consultation or you can even drop us a note on inquiries at brcgs.com. And uh, we can look at that and uh, let you know because uh, 
as far as I know, I've not, I don't remember this, seeing this guidance document. So if it is a redundant document, then we can potentially just find out why was it made redundant and uh, or if there are plans to rewrite it so we can include it within the program. Yeah, I'm just going to whip through a few here. Anna, uh, sorry, but I missed the information. When will, can you just reiterate again, when will it, version 9, be released? <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, the draft will be available. So all I, I would say is just focus on the fact that the draft will be available towards the end of the year for everyone to feed back on. Once the draft is uh, fed back on, we take it back to the working group, we finalize the version, and then it'll be published somewhere around autumn next year. So it is a 18 month process that we look at from when the process was first initiated. But uh, just focus on the fact that this around December, January, we'll have the draft draft of version nine yeah uh allison's um asking uh is a, a mandatory unannounced sort of something that might be considered in uh, issue nine i think uh, allison might have missed the information it's already live so uh version nine will just be incorporating the position statement that is already in place on our website so our the food standard packaging standard and storage and distribution they are the ones that have the mandatory one in three unannounced audit requirements. They have come in and uh, what that means is any site that is certificated to BRCGS audits, they would have to undertake one unannounced audit uh, in the year 22, 23, 24. We don't decide which year, it is down to the certification body to decide, but the site would have to undertake a one unannounced audit. This is again not just explicit to BRCGES standards, but it is a GFSI benchmark requirement. So all the certification program owners would have to undertake the same. Okay, Eunice, um, how many mock um, audits will be carried out to test the standard issue now? And usually, on what type of process or product do you test on new company or existing company? Do you consider worst case scenario? So, yeah, what. Well, can you just talk? <laughs> Very detailed, okay. So with the <laughs> pilot audits, uh, usually what we tend to test out is not the processes or uh, the elements that are old to the standard, but usually we would look focus on the new elements of the standard. Just to give you an example, so with the most current standard that's gone live, storage and distribution, what we tend to do is the mock would have been on the newer elements that we introduced within the standard. So for those of you who might have heard about storage and distribution, so we have two new additional warranty modules, one around cross-talking, one around e-commerce. So we trial them out just to see how would the auditors go about auditing. And additionally, that helps us provide guidance to the industry because considering they are new elements, we can write something up with the, just to sense check how the actual implementation works so it would be really it will depend on what the changes are essentially so it's it's very difficult to say what product type but uh whether it'll be existing or new but it would be just to make sure that the standard is relevant essentially okay uh mario um why not make BRC participate available to everyone since we only have access if the site is certified? Is that I in your guess. remit? Is that in your remit too? <laughs> uh, I was going to say a little bit out of my remit, but all I would say is um, as a business, there is there are some considerations and certain uh, added value services that we would like our sites to gain over others essentially. So why do we think it's not fair to just limit it to our sites and open it up to everyone? So, yeah, that, that is a business consideration, not in my remit, but it's just, just like any others. Uh, if there is this expertise, yes, whatever could be sent out freely is already available freely. So you can download our standards, but then the added value should be, I guess, limited to our site. User. Yeah. yeah anyway there's somewhere else you can go if you want to ask questions <laughs> um, absolutely uh for free um <laughs> a qualify uh, maria a qualified individual for food defense is specific uh 
I was just uh, saying it's a specific requirement of US uh, FISMA. So uh, all I would say is we do have a separate module, additional module on FISMA. And uh, once a uh, change comes about, we update the FISMA module. So any requirements specific to FISMA would be captured within there. So uh, yeah, qualified individual around food defense would be a requirement there potentially. I'm not so familiar with the entire FISMA regulations, the most recent ones, because we do have certain sort of experts who are quite familiar with FISMA and those are the ones that we rely on. But yeah, absolutely, this is where it will be captured. Yeah. But again, just to uh, uh, stress on the point that legislation or any legal requirement, regulatory requirements, they're always a major part of our standards. So the sites need to ensure for themselves what and uh, how are they compliant. Okay. Um, yeah. People are sort of asking what's going to be included. It's more the other way around. It's what you think perhaps should, uh, you know, there's some gaps or weaknesses in the standard. So, um, you know, Awinesh, how do you want to see BRC clauses in internal audits? Well, how do you want to see BRC clauses in internal audits? Do you think they need improving? Um, um, is there scope to include map or vacuum packing? Um, okay. Um, all I would say around this is we are just getting quite specific around certain technologies. It is fairly, um, again, we are notorious for the fact that we are very prescriptive. If we start being quite prescriptive about certain formats, certain technologies, certain operational requirements, I don't think the industry would really seek the value or the benefit they might get out of our standards. However, saying that there's always additional guidance that we publish on map vacuum packing is at least within the UK, all I would say is that the Food Safety Authority, they have published quite sort of uh, recent guidance and uh, uh, there's sort of like change in legislation so always always look at the legislation that operates within the organization oh sorry within the region that you're operating on and additionally just bear in mind that the risk assessment would be the answer your product type and uh, look at yeah the, the organism essentially so it's it's uh, fairly prescriptive whether we will whether we will not i don't know but all i would ask is if uh, i and if you could just feed it back to the consultation comments and uh, we'll take it back to the working group yeah uh okay what else have we got there can food consultants get access to brcgs participate if you are a brcgs consultant you would know the answer okay um <laughs> Can you give an example of how a food safety culture action can be measurable? Oh, I um, I am not an expert in food safety culture, and by no means I think I can be the one sort of like commenting on this. However, the requirement within our standard is you have your we don't define anything for you you are the ones who know the culture of your site so you are in a better position to identify understand what the requirements are how what the culture of the site is what we have done is given you certain areas that you can look at so feedback from your site employees there could be performance man management or you could look at certain elements of training we do have a food safety culture excellence module on our website, which is a three-way sort of partnership that is with Camden, as well as an organization called TSI. And they can help you measure these uh, uh, food safety. So they have 20 different dimensions, and uh, those dimensions will look at everything from people performance so there's proactivity and uh, it's four p's that they look at and they will measure you against it they run random questionnaires there's uh the, the there's percentages that are given as well as some sort of 
indication around what sort of what are the next steps what do you need to do to improve your food safety culture around and uh, that yeah. sort of like is a measurable element more than anything for us the one we run is not the full version the one that tsi run that is a fuller version ours is a very basic model that sites can use to measure the food yeah safety and and the, the other thing as well you've got your key performance indicators you know customer complaints rejection but, yes, absolutely. but things things like staff retention turnover um you know, you know things, things like that, like you say, questionnaires, etc. And the main thing is you've got a plan. Is that you've got a plan that says, right, these are these are our areas for improvement. These are our measures. How we're going to go about that and include things like training, um, communication. You know, they're they're the, the the big big things. But there is more and more information uh, out there, and there are more and more companies who can help you. Absolutely, uh, and ours is not like the only model. There's plenty models out there in the market that can help you, as Simon said. So it's by no means that that's the only workable one that BRCGS auditors or sites work with. Okay, uh, final question because we are, have run quite a bit over. Any clarification related to current version? Can the approach their respective region, BRCGS approved trainers? I don't understand the question, sorry, do you? Any clarification related to the current version? Um, um, if I, I'm not quite sort of uh, sure on that. Uh, but in regards to feedback, as I said, there's the consultation process. So if you are BRCGS approved trainer, there's any uh, feedback that you might have, please do feed it back through your normal channels. You can feed it back to the training team or towards BRC, sorry, the inquiries inbox, or you can even send it through the consultation comments, essentially. Yeah. Just one point from Amy. Uh, it's very frustrating that you cannot get the interpretation guide until you are already certified. <laughs> so is that the case? Can you only get the interpretation guide once you're certified? The interpretation guideline is... Uh... Yeah, it is available freely to the BRCGS certificated sites. Uh, but in case you're not, then you'll have to buy it. Yeah, so if you, it's available yeah. to, to buy, though, as well, is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, thanks for the update on the new version. Good session. Uh, um, and there were some other positive uh, comments as well before, which uh, I skipped past. I should have read them. So, right. Uh, we've gone seven minutes over, so thanks very much, Richard. Um, obviously, things are this early stage to to the version nine, and it's all about gathering feedback at the moment. So it's nothing definitive, but watch this, watch BRC website and communications and etc. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And uh, yeah, just uh, the consultation. As I said, anything you would like to see within the standard. Any, th any areas, any input, anything you would like the working group to consider, please do feed it back to us so we can just make sure that the standard stays relevant, not just to your sector of the industry, but there could be some sort of very generic challenges that the industry is facing with the sound. So anything that might be seen as added value to yourselves from based on feedback from your customer's side, please do let us know. Okay, brilliant. All right, thanks very much, Richard, and uh, good luck with uh, your baby in the future. <laughs> thanks, Simon. Yeah. All right. And thanks for having me here today. Thank you. You're welcome, Richard. Take care. Okay. Bye, bye bye. Okay, that was Richard from BRCGS. I'm just going to put your uh, certificate of attendance in the sidebar, um, which hopefully you can see. Um, so if you click the download now button, uh, that's uh, an image. Uh, you can either print it and sign it or open it in something like Microsoft Paint and uh, type your name on there. Um, we can't personalize them for you, so please do not ask. And uh, uh, thanks for your attendance today. Thanks for engaging. What we might do actually is start a topic on the IFSQN discussion forum for BRCGS9 uh, uh, 
feedback to gather some comments on there. Uh, what you like, what you don't like, what you'd like to see, um, where it needs clarifying, where you think it's too much, too less, whatever. So I think we'll do that. Uh, I've just told you what to do. You add your own name, Vabi Hav. Um, thanks very much, everybody. Friday, best day of the week. It's weekend. Enjoy, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye.